Welcome to the Business Book Awards Black Lives Matter author interview series. Hello, I'm here today with TV Springer, uh, who is the author of I Am My Brand, which was shortlisted for the 2020 Business Book Awards. And Kubi is also the, uh, the, the founder and um, owner of a business called She Builds Brands, which is all about sales and marketing. So Kubi, how did your business, how did it, how did it come about? I have such a peculiar story into the world of branding. Um, I started off as a dancer. I loved all things classical ballet uh, when I was four years old and I trained at the Royal Academy, uh, which as you know, is probably one of the most prestigious ballet schools uh, in, in the world really. Um, and then I, I, I had a situation when I was about uh, 11 that changed the trajectory of my chosen career, my first love. Um, and I ended up introducing other art forms such as hip hop and street and jazz and tap and Latin. I'm, I'm a good ballroom dancer, I am Lucy. Um, and, uh, and I got myself an agent by the time I was 12 and I, I went along the commercial route. So I was doing Top of the Pops and CD UK, which anybody who's over 30 will remember. Uh, and when I was 17, I got a big break doing the Spice Girls tour, the European tour um, which was amazing as one of their backing dancers and it was their first tour um, but then at 17 I injured my knee and I was told that my uh, my career wouldn't be able to go on and uh, and that was a real shame and so um, what what ended up happening is is someone said to me look you can talk for England why don't you go into PR and marketing and branding was a, such a new nuanced concept back then we're talking 1996 um, and so I, I, I got an internship at MTV uh, I caught the bug and I loved it and uh, and I did my undergrads uh, in, in marketing but it was kind of the entertainment end of marketing and then when I finished, I thought, right, where do I go to really learn this? Uh, and I've always had this, this thought that my granny used to teach me, which is reach for the stars and you might get the moon. And so I thought, right, I'm going to go to New York. Uh, and so I went by an internship program called Mountbatten, which was set up by Lord Mountbatten. And, uh, and when I was in New York, I ended up getting an internship working for Puff Daddy's marketing agency. Uh, we now know him as Diddy or P. Diddy. Back then he was Puff Daddy. Um, and so I worked for his marketing agency for three years and I learned so much from him because you know he was um, a black man first african-american to have a clothing line on fifth avenue next to tiffany's and I was part of that team and it, it gave me the gumption and the tenacity to just kind of step into my spotlight without apology. And I couldn't articulate it back then, but that really was the beginnings of what we now know as my book. Um, and so after working with Puff, uh, I worked with Justin Timberlake and, and Justin was a lot of fun. I did the Justify tour, assisting them with the branding and the marketing around the tour. Uh, I then built up a reputation as this kind of young girl from London uh, with a big mouth who understood all things entertainment and knew how to commercialize brands. And that led me to work with Mariah Carey. It led me to work with the Sex and the City launch of the first movie. Um, I was head of marketing for the MOBA awards. Um, and then towards the kind of, that was did Nike and, and Midnight Madness, which was uh, sport and music combined. Um, and then when I was working for MOBOs, Mobos being music of origin uh, for, for, you know, for black music. Uh, Destiny's Child was humongous and Beyonce was just about to launch her solo career. And, uh, and so I knew her camp really well and I had contacts at L'Oreal and I ended up doing a deal between Beyonce's camp and L'Oreal, that now infamous because you're worth it deal. Um, and, and I thought, this is great. And I, and I enjoyed it and I loved it. But by the time I got to about 30, I felt like I'd partied at every party I needed to party at. You know, I'd immersed myself in this entertainment celeb world and I felt a little bit empty. And what I realized then is that I wanted my career uh, to continue to work with big brands, but to also have the space to travel to what we would then call emerging markets to support people who didn't have the privilege that I had working in London and New York and LA. Um, and so the last 10 years of my career, um, I've worked quite extensively in Southeast Asia teaching brand marketing. So in Malaysia, in Singapore, in Indonesia, also doing work in Ghana and Nigeria and parts of the Caribbean and really just teaching people 
who are either one in micro businesses um, or women led businesses. A lot of my work now is around women led businesses um, about what's the formula around brand marketing. Um, and so I call that my hobby <laughs> and my day job is still as a consultant. So most recent clients include people like Aston Martin, um, supporting Aston Martin on taking what would be a very old boys brand um, and they had their first female chairman and uh, and I was part of the campaign to say well how do we also market to powerful women who want an Aston Martin car so that's kind of how my career has panned out fantastic I mean when you tell the story like that Kubi it sounds as if you've just stepped effortlessly up the ladder <laughs> everything's fallen into place for you you've worked with all the famous people has it um, has it actually been like that, or have you had um, have you have you had moments when you um, well, you know when things weren't going so well, and has um, has the colour of your skin impacted on your your career in any negative way? You know, it's interesting because I always say to people, what version of the story do you want? Do you want the PR face and tick box Mariah, tick box, you know, do you want that? Or do you want the meat? Uh, and, and in my book, I Am My Brand, what I was committed to do was given the meat of the truth of the journey of building a, a personal brand. Um, so if we go back, uh, I, when I trained at the Royal Academy, uh, when I was 11 years old, what changed me from moving beyond ballet, even though it was my first love, is because I was told um, that I wasn't allowed to audition for the call to ballet because of the color of my skin. Now, the year was 1996. And if you think about the opera house and you think about traditional classics like, you know, like Sleeping Beauty, like Swan Lake, in the 80s, they didn't have any black girls in the corps de ballet. They didn't even have dark skin tights. I used to wear pink tights and I used to have to take my natural hair and put lots of gel so that it could smoothly go into a bun because we were only allowed to have our hair in a bun. Um, and, and, and then I didn't know how much that had an impact on my sense of uh, identity or struggling with my identity. Um, but I have, a, I have an innate ability to try and bounce back from adversity. But what I did in the book is I talked about that actually that became the impetus for my why. You know, that 11 year old girl being told that she wasn't allowed to step into her spotlight because of the color of her skin is the very reason why I've worked with people like Diddy who are unapologetic and Mariah Carey who doesn't care if you call her a diva, she's still gonna be a millionaire and, and do it her way. You know, it's the reason why I've worked with people like, you know, Beyonce and even to this day working with, you know, Facebook as a client and what they stand for and Aston Martin now trying to break boundaries. There's no, it's, it's, it, there's no coincidence that what happened to that little black 11 year old girl has really put me to where I am now. Um, so yeah, it, it, it's absolutely impacted. I mean, there are other things that, for example, um, you, you know, even with the book, I remember when uh, Bloomsbury Publishers wanted to put my face on the front cover with my afro out. And I've got to tell you, I, I had palpitations. I, for, for weeks, I argued with them saying, it's not going to sell. You know, I was like, I'm not Michelle Obama. I'm not Beyonce. I'm not Oprah. You know, no one knows who I am. And, and, and it's England, which has institutionalized racism. So who's going to buy it in Yorkshire? Um, and it took me you know, it took my commercial brain coming on where actually they said Barnes and Nobles in America said they'll double their order if we put your picture on the front cover. And I said, OK, fine. <laughs> All right. <laughs> if commercially it's going to sell, fine. Um, but that's how much damage had been done that I didn't even realise. No, no. But, but, but yeah, that's really interesting that the publishing industry, which is notoriously white, um, had wanted to showcase you as a genuine, authentic black woman in all your glory, and and <laughs> with with obviously with commercial reasons to do it. But um, but did you feel then supported? Did you feel that that was a um, that was a, a, a good you know? Did you feel empowered by having that support? I felt petrified. <laughs> That's the truth. I felt petrified, and and the whole book is is really um me telling a story from a place of vulnerability and and hoping 
um, and, and the feedback has said that it has done this, giving women particularly the permission to recognize that actually we all have an intersection in life of pain and how do we overcome that? You know, the other thing that I had to grapple with, and I, I have a, a, a exercise in the book that gets you to look at your journey over the years so that you can really identify your why. And one of my intersections is that I, I grew up in a middle class family. So my parents and, and I as a family, we used to get called the Cosby's because we were the only black family in Dulwich on a row of doctors and surgeons. And, you know, here was my mom as a management consultant. And, and, and yet at the same time, when I went to uh, in front of people, they didn't, you know, they would say things like, well, you don't sound like a black girl. And I'm like, well, what is a black girl meant to sound like? You know, or, or you know, I've traveled to Malaysia and had my passport questioned because I'm in business class. And they say, well, no, you're African. Where did you get this passport? And I'm like, well, you can't buy it on eBay, mate. <laughs> you know? It's like, where do you think I've got my passport? So I think, unfortunately, um, race really has been... Um, center in my career both in propelling me in what I do uh, now as a 40 year old woman I'm unapologetic and, and and recognize that my my difference is my strength and I teach people that but it's also been very painful along the journey as well you know I mean in the intersection of of, um, of color and gender technically <laughs> you're you're in the kind of you know in the worst intersection there, there is Yes. Um, we've done uh, absolutely amazingly and, and uh, I, you know regardless of any of that but ha has the book um, has the book got the message across to the people you want it to come across to what sort of response has it had I mean it's been so interesting so we've sh we've sold now just shy of 8,000 copies and it only came out last October which is just amazing um, but what I think beyond just the numbers that I've loved is I've had women in the States, as an example, black and white women, particularly when the George Floyd situation happened, say that they walked into their local Barnes and Nobles and they picked it up because of the front cover. Um, I've had um, I've had gay men say to me, you know, finally there's a representation and then when they get into the meat of the book it, it uh, it's packed with tools for them to find their own strength because the truth of the matter is you can't build your place your brand unless you build it from a place of authenticity until you own who you truly are you can't really market your personal brand uh, you know it's not about an elevator pitch it's not about a 60 second sales pitch it's about truth and it's about stepping into the room owning your truth um and the feedback, I mean, even today on, on Instagram, I got a DM message uh, from, a, from a white woman who happened to be, you know, in, in middle England, who said, you know, this has just brought me to tears because you're so honest and you're so truthful. And I think because she's a woman, even though she might not be a black woman, she also feels that pain because she's had her own intersections as a woman in business. Um, so, yeah, it, it appears to be doing exactly what Bloomsbury and I have to applaud them because they had the courage to push me what they knew it would do. That's brilliant. That's uh, really, that's fantastic. And uh, I'm so glad the book was shortlisted. Um, in the me too. Of Thank you. <laughs> it's such a shame that we weren't able to have the event um, in, you know, in person this year. We had to go online with it, but um, oh, it was great. It was, uh, it was still fabulous online, wasn't it? I thoroughly enjoyed it. <laughs> Good. That's great. So, um, has it has it helped you at all to be shortlisted in the in the business book awards? Absolutely. I think what it does is it gives um, it gives your 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 book an element of credibility. Um, I think what's happened with the book is that I found myself doing training on even bigger stages. Um, so in the last less than a year, I've done everything from Vogue's conference to Harper's Bazaar to Stylist Live um, to uh, you know I've got a, a, an article coming out this week on Business Insider. So I think absolutely, I think being part of your alumni now, your beautiful alumni of authors. Um, has really just given the book the weight that um, I think the content needed. And, and, and also I think what was, was good that you chose the market and sales category is that I still think there were some people, and I even had an incident um, at your nominations party where someone came up and they said, maybe this book should have been in the inspirational section. And I thought, well, if it was a white woman on the front cover, would you have said that? 
No, it's a, it's a marketing book in its truest sense with somebody who's got 24 years in marketing who just so happens to be black. Um, and so I'm really grateful that you did put it in that category because again, it reinforces that black women don't need to sit in the inspirational box or the diversity box. You know, we're just as qualified. So thank you for that. You're not, you're not only there to be exceptional, you are, you need to become the rule as well as the exception. I agree, 110%. And, and, and having, you know, my parents and I had a conversation about what that person had said at your nominations uh, launch. And, uh, and my parents said, well, you know, thank God they had the gumption to put it in the right category. Um, and, and it's true, it really is. So thank you. So Tizzy, can I ask you how the uh, recent Black Lives Matter following George Floyd's death, how, how has that impacted on you? Um, I think personally it's been um, tough. Um, I don't think there is a black parent anywhere who's now not having to have exceptionally hard conversations. Um, I think that, you know, there are, there are those who think that this is an American problem um, and it really isn't. You know, I, 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 I know people who have died in police custody in the UK. Um, and now we're, you know, we're having to talk to our, our seven and eight year olds about why this is happening and, um, and what they need to do if they get stopped by the police. You know, I have friends in America who are having such tough conversations, particularly with their black boys. Um, so personally, it's really hard. It's really hard. Um, but I am also elated at how different it is this time. You know, my mother lived through the civil rights movement. Um, my mom is an activist herself, as that's where I get it from. Um, and, and her and I have said it's different this time. You know, the marches that sees people from all races and all social economic backgrounds marching together. Uh, the fact that, that white people are actually saying, I do have white privilege and that they don't feel ashamed to say it or, you know, ap overly apologizing for it. Just the acknowledgement. Um, I've had colleagues, uh, you know, in the business world send me bunches of flowers and say, we didn't realize, I'm sorry. Um, I've had conversations with people who've said, you know, what do we do? So I think it's, it's different. And, and as a black woman, it's beautiful to see that actually everybody's saying this isn't acceptable and it could be your friend. It could be your, you know, son-in-law, you know? And, and so I think that that's wonderful. Um, I also think, and I wrote an article on brand activism, which, which ended up being um, aired uh, in, in, in um, BBC World. We ended up having a, a conversation about it last week. That's around what next? And I think that there is a responsibility that I think organizations for the most part are taking up to say, how do we, first of all, look at what's going on internally with our brand? Do we have enough representation at boardroom level, at C-suite level, um, number one, so that we can make a decision, strategic commercial decisions. And there's a commercial business case as to why you want to ensure that you have diversity inside the organization and outside. But do we have it at sea level is the most important thing. And what does that look like from a HR perspective? You know, I'm having a conversation we have a client that looks at seed funding for, for women in tech. And I'm saying, well, it's all well and good saying that here's a pot of money, but how do you now market it to make sure that those who need to see the marketing to get access to the money are seeing it? So I think there's some real good what next conversations that are happening. Um, I think personally, it's put me in the best position ever. <laughs> because you know it's, I, was, I was running a, a joke with a friend yesterday and, and she said QB you've always been there but now they're recognizing it um and so you know with my depth of experience um it means that there's plenty of opportunity to assist companies and um on on how they they build on this momentum that's, that's brilliant so just asking um, specifically, have you got any suggestions or advice for how we take this forward in the Business Book Awards? We, we championed the, the second year after 
our first um, our first set of winners were, were white men. Um, we championed women and getting more women to write and publish their business books. And then last year we were very much more about diversity in general. Um, how, how would you suggest we take this forward? Do you, or do you have any suggestions? Um, I think, first of all, I think what you're doing at the moment is fantastic. I think the fact that you even recognise from year one to year two, change needs to be made. I think you and your team should absolutely pat, pat yourself on the back because not everybody's prepared to recognise and then take action. Um, so I think that that's uh, completely phenomenal. I think what I would maybe suggest is one of the things that, that we as black people and I, and I say we in the broader strength, because I can't talk for everybody, but based on the conversations I've had over the years, what we don't want is tokenism. What we want is recognition on an equal playing field. So would I suggest that you have an awards that's specifically for Black Lives Matter? No, I, I, I wouldn't, because I don't believe that's necessarily what we want. I think what we want is that if another book lands on your table that's got a Black woman that's a marketing book, that it's just seen for what it is. And, and, that, and that anybody that makes a silly comment that it should be an inspirational book, that somebody in the room says, well, why? Um, so I think we just want an equal playing field. Um, and, and, that our, and, and that the only thing maybe I would recommend that you do, and I'm doing this with corporates, is maybe looking at where your marketing is so that people from ethnic minority backgrounds um, are seeing it. Um, and so that they recognize, and I know at your launch, you said that those who are published and unpublished can also have access to the awards. And I think that's amazing because there's so many people within the black community who are unpublished because they think that the publishing world is not for them. They think that the institution is not going to say yes to them. Um, and so, you know, just making sure that the marketing reaches those, those people, the messages gets out to them. And then just keep doing what you're doing um, because what you're doing is fantastic. Phoebe, thank you very much. It's been absolutely great to talk to you. And I hope your next book will come out before too long. Oh, it is. I'm working on it now. Um, and so, yeah, fingers crossed. <laughs> thank you so much, Phoebe Springer. Thank you for having me.